I think it, it was Yogi Berra uh, who said, I'm paraphrasing, that uh, predicting uh, is a risky uh, business, except especially if it's about the future. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <laughs> to deal both with Armageddon and uh, a prophecy of the return is a, um, a difficult and serious subject. <laughs> and uh, when I started writing, my books, uh, which uh, uh, began uh, almost, uh, for almost 40 years ago. <coughs> uh, the first book was titled The Twelfth Planet. I knew, I knew then almost 40 years ago that whatever volume the final one in the series called The Earth Chronicles will be, uh, <coughs> it will have to deal with the end of days, which is the uh, name <coughs> given by the Bible, in the Bible, to prophecies of uh, the last days, the end time, and uh, <coughs> any other way <coughs> that uh, the term uh, in Hebrew, which is Zaharita <coughs> Yamim, is rendered. <coughs> uh, and I delayed, I really delayed uh, writing that final book uh, for two reasons. Number one is that uh, I felt uh, I need to do more research and actually it took another 30 years of research to um, be able to give a, a, a plausible answer, one which I, uh, I believe is the correct answer, but uh, at least it should be sufficiently documented to be plausible. <coughs> um, and the other reason is that uh, uh, I don't know if everybody uh, will be happy uh, with the conclusions of that uh, book, The End of Days. Uh, certainly, I think, many of those that uh, uh, are dealing, the, specializing in the subject of what's about to happen <coughs> uh, have uh, focused uh, recently on, uh, on 2012 A.D. <coughs> uh, if, if I... If I wanted to be nasty, which maybe I should be, is I can tell you right off that the only thing certain about 2012 that uh, there'll be another presidential election then, <laughs> and that no matter who you vote for uh, this time, uh, you will say, let's get rid of the bum. <laughs> uh, because otherwise, what, what is supposed to happen in 2012. Uh, <clears throat> it is mostly linked uh, with the so-called uh, Mayan, Mayan calendar uh, or Mayan prophecies, and I'll uh, talk about it in greater detail uh, as, as we go along. <laughs> but uh, as I understand what, what others are saying is that uh, it is a time that uh, is some, something, the present, the past, will come to an end, and uh, something something will happen. And when you are uh, pressing those uh, others who specialize in 2012 and you ask them uh, uh, what, what will happen, um, they say, well, uh, there's a planet. <laughs> there's a planet that, that, that makes some great orbit and periodically uh, comes to our vicinity. And at that time, it, uh, it causes all kinds of, of havoc. And... Uh, in, in uh, connection or in response to, to such kinds of prophecies, my answer is that, uh, to, or rather to remind the, the audience that uh, the same claims were made in regard, I don't know why, but in regard to 2003, and that uh, that's when the planet, the unknown planet, planet X, uh, will, will arrive and uh, do all kinds of uh, unpleasant things to us. <coughs> Uh, or maybe good things. And if you will recall, the same kind of prophecies were uh, uh, connected with the, with the millennium, the year 2000. And uh, 
in one way or another, they are always uh, coming back to planet X. And if you say, what is planet X? Uh, <coughs> oh, that is the planet about which uh, this guy Sitchin has been writing. <coughs> uh, so what, what, is, uh, what is this planet X? And uh, when, uh, when really is it supposed to come back to our vicinity? And what is supposed to happen uh, when it does? <coughs> I uh, started to, to write about it, as uh, many of you may know, in my first book, The Twelfth Planet. Uh, it took me more than 30 years uh, to research that uh, material for, for that book. Uh, it was published uh, the first time in 1976. <coughs> the um, uh, English, uh, not hardcover, it's softcover, but, but the paperback, the paperback edition, uh, which is still uh, selling uh, <coughs> everywhere, uh, had about 50 printings by now, which is a record for the publishers. Uh, <coughs> the book has been uh, translated into uh, some 24, 23, 24 languages, and uh, I can share with you a personal uh, irritation, and that is that one uh, recent uh, night uh, I was awakened from a sleep, which uh, uh, it's, it's not easy for me lately to fall asleep. And uh, the phone, which is also a fax machine, rang around 12.30 a.m. And uh, when I checked who, who, who is trying to reach me at this time, a fax from Hanoi that a publisher in Vietnam wants to translate into Vietnamese, the 12th planet. And though, uh, you know, it's been translated by now to any, almost any language you can think of, I was thinking to myself, somebody in Vietnam, in Hanoi, after all that uh, that place means uh, to us, uh, <laughs> that, that, that this is really something. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> now what I did in the 12th planet, and maybe that is the reason for its uh, success and for its uh, still being so uh, uh, powerfully around, is that I brought to life a civilization that was hardly known before, uh, and that is the Sumerian civilization. I find it, although uh, now more and more I find in articles, in other books, etc., reference to the Sumerian civilization, to the Sumerians, I find that it's still uh, easier for even those who deal with that, like museums, to say Babylonian. For example, <laughs> there is now in Europe uh, an exhibit uh, from uh, ancient Mesopotamia uh, where three museums, uh, the one in London, in Paris, and in Berlin, have combined to uh, put together some of their uh, uh, objects and show them in each, of the, each one of the three places. <laughs> and uh, they refer to it as the Babylonian exhibit. So, uh, uh, almost 40 years ago when uh, I or anybody else would say to somebody, well, you know the Sumerian civilization, you would get some kind of a uh, blank look, you know, the Sumerian, you know, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I brought to life uh, the Sumerian civilization, uh, which was really a most amazing civilization. It uh, blossomed out in what is now southern Iraq, in that part of the world. This is the, the ancient Near East, this is the Mediterranean Sea, the, the, the Red Sea, Egypt, uh, Assyria, Turkey, which was the Hittites then, uh, etc. <coughs> so about 6,000 years ago, an incredible civilization appeared there, and all those that deal with it use such words as uh, suddenly, unexpectedly, out of nowhere, because there was no gradual or any kind of uh, precedential civilization that, that you had this and this and this and this is, was a, a, high, a higher level, a higher stage. Suddenly, from what we may call primitive, though they were not primitive people, <coughs> but you know, they were uh, farmers, hunters, uh, etc. But suddenly there appeared 
cities, uh, high-rise buildings, uh, organi societal organization, kings, priests, um, um, codes of law, uh, literature, art, music, musical instruments, all of that within <coughs> a very short uh, uh, period, appeared about 6,000 years ago. And uh, I sometimes find it necessary to uh, ask people to stop for a minute and think what is 6,000 years. So we are about 2,000 years removed from the time of Jesus. Now, that time was about 2,000 years removed from the time of Abraham. And then add to that another 2,000 years, and that's where we are talking about where this great uh, civilization uh, appeared so suddenly. And uh, without <laughs> devoting the whole evening to that civilization and all the thirsts to, to which we owe a debt, for example, if, if you look at your watch and you have 60 minutes uh, in an hour, why do you have 60 minutes? Because that's the basic Sumerian mathematical system called sexagesimal day 60. They went from 1 to 60 and then, like we go from 1 to 100 and 101, then we go, they went from 1 to 60 and then 61, so there was day 60. A circle <coughs> has 360 degrees. Why? Because it is 60 times 6. Indeed, the whole Sumerian mathematical system was based on that. 6 times 10 times 6 times 10, etc. So you had 6 and 60 and 360 and 3,600 and, and so on and so forth, up to very high uh, numbers in uh, going. Uh, some, some tablets were found with the, starting with, with mathematical tables with 2,196,000 2, tables of division from that. <coughs> So the legacy of Sumer, be it in, in uh, the first wheel and, and so on and so forth, <coughs> uh, is, is, is really incredible. <coughs> so, but I want to uh, mention tonight <coughs> at least three or three of their first. One is writing. <coughs> and they <coughs> developed a writing system called cuneiform, where we described using <coughs> a, um, a stylus would make wedge-like. Uh, symbols or indentations in wet clay, which when it dried uh, would uh, become a permanent record. I don't have a, a sample of a tablet with me, but uh, let's say that this is a uh, clay tablet, and I once uh, <coughs> held up a copy of my book, not this one, this is a DVD, and I said, uh, wh which one of the two do you think would last another thousand years? the printed book or the clay tablet? And the answer is the clay tablet. <laughs> so we have uh, writing, which of course meant uh, a language and grammar and literature and, and epic tales and lullabies were written down, the recipes, for example, in the book, The Twelfth Planet, I give us an example, <coughs> a recipe for what the French call coq au vin, meaning a chicken uh, cooked in wine. Uh, there were uh, proverbs. Uh, uh, it, it's really mind-boggling, but I won't spend the whole evening on that. So writing was one of them. Another thing was pictorial depictions. They uh, took uh, uh, stones, mostly semi-precious stones, and made cylinders about an inch or so, sometimes longer, but basically about an inch, a cylinder of an inch, and would engrave, and nobody has figured out to this day how, in this hard stone, they would make an engraving in reverse, like a negative, which when rolled on wet clay, would become a permanent Egypt, a permanent <coughs> uh, depiction, the way we uh, say print, print our presses, the rotary uh, presses now, the newspapers. <coughs> so uh, uh, literally uh, thousands of cylinder seals and even more so their imprints have been found 
and any uh, museum uh, uh, worth its salt uh, has, has, has these uh, cylinder seals or their imprints on, on display. And those uh, uh, depictions uh, tell us a lot, and I will refer to some of them. <coughs> and uh, the third thing that uh, uh, I would like to uh, mention and, and, and stress uh, this evening was the high-rise buildings. Uh, they uh, were the first to use bricks and to build high-rise buildings, uh, like stage pyramids that would rise 100, 120, 160 or more feet <coughs> high. Uh, some uh, think that uh, these were the towers of Babel, uh, mentioned in the Bible. Actually, it's not so, but uh, every major city, Sumerian city, had a sacred precinct and the sacred prison had such a <coughs> uh, ziggurat, as they were called. And they were used primarily uh, for uh, uh, astronomical observation. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, their knowledge of astronomy, or in the field of astronomy, is one of the most amazing uh, Sumerian legacies. <coughs> this is, for example, the imprint of a cylinder seal you can actually see the seal uh, in Jerusalem. There's a museum there called uh, Bible Lens Museum. And uh, uh, this is, uh, if you ask a, uh, a regular scholar, uh, what, what is it, they'll show it. You'll say this is a beer drinking scene because uh, uh, the Sumerians were also the first to invent beer. Uh, and drinking beer was a social event. Uh, you can see people are coming to participate in that, and beer was drunk through a straw, uh, the way I understand in, say, in Latin America or in Argentina, they drink uh, mate, mate tea uh, with, with, with a straw. <laughs> but as many other cylinder seals, uh, they were decorated with celestial symbols. And if you study this one, uh, you find out that uh, it depicts the sun, it depicts the earth and its moon, it depicts what we call the asteroid belt, which is a belt orbiting between Mars and Jupiter, and nobody knows, or nobody, I mean, I say nobody because I do. <laughs> <laughs> Others claim they don't know how it came about. It's the remains of some planet that... Uh, was destroyed, exploded, except that if a planet explodes, the pieces fly in all directions, and in this case, <laughs> they orbit like a belt between Mars and Jupiter. So you also have Mars and Jupiter, uh, here's Jupiter, you have the asteroid belt, which we have discovered only in modern times, and beyond Jupiter, you have Saturn and its rings, which we uh, did not know about until the invention of the telescope. Now, this cylinder seal is from about 2000 BC, from 4,000 years ago. So this is an example of the amazing uh, Sumerian uh, knowledge in astronomy. <coughs> but there is even m one more amazing cylinder seal, uh, which uh, caused uh, quite uh, an uproar at the museum where it's kept. It's, it's in a museum in Berlin at the time <coughs> when I... Uh, came across <coughs> its existence. It was East Berlin, uh, but they cooperated with me. They sent me a photograph. And uh, if you ask uh, uh, scholars what, <coughs> what is the scene depicted, they say, well, this is the god of agriculture granting the plow, a primitive plow, to mankind. A representative of mankind is introduced by a lesser god to the main god, who grants the, the, the plow. And uh, just as an aside, I'll say so, you tell those same uh, scholars at the museum or in, in any of their <coughs> scientific magazines, say, so there was a god of agriculture, and that's how you look. You say, no, no, that's, that's a mythological scene. That's just mythology. But whatever it is, there is an interesting celestial depiction on this one, and uh, this is what it shows. It shows a star surrounded by planets. 
Now, the, the, this, this error is, is my addition to uh, enable comparison with our knowledge of uh, the solar system. So we have the sun, not the earth, we have the sun in the center, surrounded by planets, all the planets we know of in the correct sizes and in the correct order. Except that here there is one more planet, right here, between Mars and Jupiter, where the asteroid belt is now. So according to the Sumerians, there was a planet there, uh, probably, or one must conclude, the planet which apparently broke up somehow. <clears throat> now, uh, if you could uh, get hold of Sumerian guy and say to him, uh, what planet was that and what is the somehow? How, how did that planet uh, break up? You say, well, that, that's, uh, <laughs> you're asking me something that has uh, been written about uh, in one of our books. It happens to be a clay tablet, not uh, the way we, we uh, think of books. And that tablet uh, is actually part of uh, seven tablets. And uh, once they were discovered uh, in a library in northern Mesopotamia, in an ancient library in northern Mesopotamia, and it did contents of that uh, uh, story on, on those tablets uh, was, was uh, deciphered. Uh, they have since been referred as the seven tablets of creation, paralleling the biblical tale of the seven days of creation, six days of actual creation, and then one day in praise of, of the Creator. <coughs> so uh, uh, this is uh, one of the tablets, I think uh, uh, the fourth one out of the seven, uh, known as uh, the Epic of Creation, <coughs> uh, or sometimes known by its uh, opening lines, which is how the Sumerians used to name their uh, epic tales or, or uh, their uh, tablets in library catalogs, because they were actually <laughs> set in, in, in libraries, and on each shelf there was a tablet that listed all the texts that are on that particular shelf, like a catalog uh, tablet. Uh, so, no, it's not sometimes known by its opening words, Enuma, Enuma Elish. <clears throat> now, what does the Enuma Elish uh, say? The Enuma Elish says, uh, tells the story how the uh, earth uh, <coughs> came to be, how uh, our moon came to be. It was Yogi Berra uh, who said, I'm paraphrasing, that uh, predicting uh, is a risky uh, business, except especially if it's about the future. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <laughs> to deal both with Armageddon and uh, a prophecy of the return is a, um, a difficult and serious subject. <laughs> and uh, when I started writing my books, uh, which uh, uh, began uh, almost uh, for almost 40 years ago. Uh, the first book was titled The Twelfth Planet. I knew, I knew then almost 40 years ago that whatever volume the final one in the series called The Earth Chronicles will be, uh, it will have to deal with the end of days, which is the uh, name <coughs> given by the Bible, in the Bible, to prophecies of uh, the last days, the end time, and uh, <coughs> any other way <coughs> that uh, the term in Hebrew, which is Zacharit Yamim, <coughs> is rendered. <coughs> uh, and I delayed, I really delayed uh, writing that final book uh, for two reasons. Number one is that uh, I felt uh, I need to do more research and actually it took another 30 years of research to um, be able to give a, a, a plausible answer, one which I, uh, I believe is the correct answer, but uh, at least 
it should be sufficiently documented to be plausible. <coughs> um, and the other reason is that uh, uh, I don't know if everybody uh, will be happy uh, with the conclusions of that uh, book, The End of Days. Uh, certainly, I think, <coughs> many of those that uh, uh, are dealing with the specializing in the subject of what's about to happen <coughs> uh, have uh, focused uh, recently on, uh, on 2012 AD. <coughs> uh, if, if, I, <laughs> if I wanted to be nasty, which maybe I should be, is I will tell you right off that the only thing certain about 2012 that uh, there'll be another presidential election then, <laughs> and that no matter who you vote for uh, this time, uh, you will say, let's get rid of the bum. <laughs> <coughs> uh, because otherwise, what, what is supposed to happen 